All right, now that I'm recording, I usually hold this like blue snowball in my hand. Um, did this since workshop number six because we were having audio issues earlier, but it's all right. So welcome to the Arduino workshop. I know this is covering like half the screen. Let me just make sure I'm recording. Let me just make sure I'm doing the microphone well. Okay, everything seems like it's in order. So hide video panel. Oh, that wasn't the right one. Hide the floating meeting controls. There we go. Uh, all right. Okay, I can't pin anyone because I'm the only one here. All right, so I'm recording on Zoom. That's how I usually do it. And if anyone wants to come in, I usually let them in. Uh, they want to attend virtually. But, you know, it's way more fun in person. So today we're going to be learning about Arduino and all about how, you know, we can use this sort of, like, piece of electronics to our advantage when designing and building electronics uh, at a hobbyist level. So let's first talk about what exactly Arduino is. It's lagging there. So section one is what is Arduino? And if just, this is your first time coming to this workshop. I usually do things in sections. Um, I've gotten better at managing my time throughout the workshop, but this thing has like seven different sections, so we're going to try to get through them in an hour. So exactly what, Ardu what is Arduino? So Arduino is open source hardware. It's a development board that hobbyists usually use to build low-scale electronics really easily. And it's also modular and flexible depending on what you put on it. So pretty much uh, it has a lot of things. So you can do things like this constructing digital electronic systems. Um, you can also construct devices and inventions. So maybe something along the lines of um, a sync that turns on when you tell it to, uh, like a voice controlled sync, or maybe you're just building an RC car, or maybe you're building the Hyperloop pod. Um, any sort of electronics at that scale where you don't have too much going on, you can use an Arduino to do so. It's very flexible. It's also used for simple computing, so not just like for hardware, but also like the software things as well. Um, for Arduinos, usually we talk about inputs and outputs and interfacing with this sort of electronics. So it's like a computer, except we can put stuff in it from the real world, like sensors, and we can take stuff out. And so inputs are things like, you know, like a barometer, like an air pressure sensor, a temperature sensor, um, things like switches, buttons, things that can provide the computer with some sort of, um, some sort of signal. And outputs we call, like, we can control motors, we can control stepper motors, and also more robotic equipment. So, you know, putting all this together, we eventually get what's called a control system, basically taking our inputs and then causing some sort of like output signal for them. So this is the whole aspect of what we're doing um, you know, with RC cars as well. And just as interest, this is brought down here on the done left corner is called Arduino Nano. There are different types of Arduinos we'll talk about later on, but this is probably one of the cheapest official boards you can get. Uh, and throughout the workshop, I'll talk about my stripe with um, these kind of boards. That's the Arduino logo. And this is a really fancy circular board that Adafruit sells. All right, so what are microcontrollers? Now, there is a common misconception when they talk about microcontrollers that people just directly relate microcontrollers with Arduino. But Arduino is, well, it does contain a microcontroller, but it isn't a microcontroller itself. This is a microcontroller, examples right here. These are tiny little chips that allow you to interface with logic in, inside of the uh, chip itself. Now, the Arduino is kind of like a breakout board for this kind of electronics. It outsources these pins into little things that you can like put wires into. So you can like put inputs in through the wire, you can put outputs in. They used to have these sort of like large scale DIP chips, which are known as dual inline package. And they're like really large, so you can stick it in a breadboard. But nowadays we don't do this anymore. We use like these things. These are like surface mount chips. And you can't really like stick a wire like, and you know, try to like put it very, very close to this really small wire. So it's not really practical in that sense. And that's why we usually um, have Arduinos to do so. And that's why in the previous image, you can see here this Arduino, this little chip in the center is what, is what controls all the logic. That's its brain, right? Everything else is kind of like getting things from the brain. So it's like kind of like the arms from the brain, like the legs from the brain. Um, it's not a human, but, you know, it's a computing device. It's pretty close. Uh, I can talk about some of these things. I'm going to talk more about them later. But pretty much microcontroller, microcontrollers is the chip on the Arduino board. Um, and the basic Arduino microcontrollers are the 18 mega 328P, which if you're, you know, if you have no experience with Arduino, this is probably like the first chip you're going to use, right? Arduino Uno, Arduino Nano, Arduino Mega, they all use this sort of chip. And these are like the same thing, by the way, I think. No, they're not the same thing. But the 328P has both a DIP version and a SMB version. So like a large scale version and a small scale version. But no one makes these anymore. It's really old. Yes. 
So the difference between a Uno, a Nano, and a Mega Chip, it's really funny because there is probably no difference between them other than the fact that there's more uh, GPIO pins. So like there's more compatibility. There's more things you can like put in, take out. So again, it's like Nano is like the smallest one. So there's not m like many uh, GPIO pins there. But as you go up the ladder, like Uno has a lot more pins. Mega has a lot of pins, like almost like 30 to 40 GPIO pins. So if you're working with like a really large scale project, let's say you're building like a pinball machine that has like 80 different sensors, like 40, 40 different motors, you're probably gonna want to use a Mega, right? So it, it really all depends on what your application for the project is. And we'll discuss more boards later. I like that question. The question is, can you daisy chain an Arduino to like another Arduino or like a Raspberry Pi? Was, I don't know if, if you said Raspberry Pi, but like that's going to be one of the applications. So the answer is yes. And the way you do it is through uh, what's called UART, basically serial. There's two pins on every Arduino that's like the RX and TX pins, and pretty much you can pass signals through them. And they, they're like communication channels. So when you go into deeper uh, on communication protocols and how to like connect your microcontroller for like other electronics, those will be what you're talking about, like UART, SPI, and I2C. And if those terms just flew right over your head, uh, not to worry. We'll go over some sensors that you will use later in this lab that are those communication protocols. Yes? Yeah, that's correct. So the I2C pins, usually the master in, slave out, and master out, slave in, mostly MISO, um, you can, they're multiplexed with the GPIO pins. So you can use both at the same time. Right? I think that was a question. So um, the newer version, which we are going to use today, uh, I'm going to reference this a lot, it's called the Arduino Pro Micro. Um, now, the Arduino Pro Micro is kind of like the um, younger brother of the 328P. It's the newer version, and also it's distinctive by the fact that it has a U4 at the end. Now, this just represents that you know, it's a newer chip and it also has USB 2.0 support. So if you are a keyboard hobbyist, if you love keyboards and working with keyboards, right, a lot of keyboard enthusiasts actually use this uh, microcontroller on their keyboard because it allows them to access their computer. Basically, there's commands that you know, sends from this chip over to your computer that the computer recognizes it's a keyboard press or mouse movement. Right? So it's newer technology and comes with USB 2.0 support. And um, the board we're using called the Pro Micro is much cheaper than the Arduino Nano, which is kind of like odd, right? And we'll go more into like the economics of Arduino later on. Okay, so I was getting to this. Um, so this is the first version of Arduino, which is basically the Nano, the Uno, and the Mega. Uh, so pretty much there are a ton of boards, basically. Um, there's clones of boards, there's like different variations of boards, but they all come from the fact that they have the same like chip. Now, the Arduino, again, is not a microcontroller itself, but it's a house for a microcontroller. Uh, the microcontroller is right here, right here, and everything else helps it function. So like, there's things like a crystal oscillator, basically an external clock for the microcontroller, because everything inside one of these MCUs runs on like a clock signal, right? So there's a, US, a USB interface chip, too, in, a, in case you want to like connect it to a USB. This is a really big USB. I don't really see these anymore. Uh, but if you buy an Arduino Nano, you'll see them. Like a reset switch, voltage regulator, power port, uh, and some of the header pins that we'll talk about as well. Now, Unos are like really, these are like really nice to use compared to like just a regular microcontroller because it tells you a lot of information about what you're doing in your experiments. So for example, if you're um, trying to power this thing using like nine volts, uh, by the way, Arduinos usually get powered by five to 12 volts of voltage, um, but you know, this thing can only handle like five volts. So basically what this does is it regulates down to a safe voltage for it to power itself. Something like RXTX LEDs, these are amazing for debugging. So if you're running into an issue and you don't know what's going on, usually you can take a look at these LEDs and seeing if your Arduino is getting a signal, especially if you're trying to daisy chain them <laughs> because these will tell you if your Arduino is receiving a signal from the other Arduino or not. So there's a lot of indications the more you work with this. There's a lot of utility, as we call it, um, that allows Arduinos to function really well uh, when you're doing electronics. So applications of this, you can use it in robotics, fast computation, you can have detection mechanisms, and also you can make a controller. Okay, hardware, let's move on. So hardware, what are we talking about here? Um, this is the Arduino Pro Micro. This is the board we're going to be using today, so that's why I'm going to go ahead and showcase it on this kind of board. Now, the Arduino Pro Micro is a lot smaller scale than the Arduino Nano. It has much less GPIO pins, and it's a much more compact interface. So you'll see a lot of things here, and it might look like a maze of things, but for power-wise, how do you power the Arduino? That's going to be our main question to answer in this slide. 
you can power from the USB port. That's probably like the safest way because USB delivers about five amp, uh, five volts and about 500 milliamps from the computer directly to your board. So USB port is safe because there's a voltage regulator attached to it. So we're also going to start thinking about ways we can potentially destroy this thing. You can also power it from the VCC slash ground pins. Now this has like reverse polarity protection, which is good. If you want to get two wires, like a red wire and a black wire, and stuff it inside the VCC and ground pin, it'll regulate itself down to five volts immediately. It's very useful. You can also do it from the raw and ground pins. When you see the word raw, that just means raw voltage. Pretty much it's not regulated. So you can put like nine volts in, 12 volts in, whatever the case may be. Not above 12 volts though, because then it's going to start frying. But you know, raw just stands for like a VN. You know what that means. Oh, here, here's, a, here's one thing. Never power the Arduino from the GPIO pins. And like, don't do that for the Raspberry Pi, ESP32, anything else too. So what I mean by this is don't try to put five volts in one of these things and then ground it and expect it to work. Reason being is because these aren't regulated, right? So if you have reverse polarity across one of these pins, this thing is gonna explode. Same different, uh, same, diff same as if you like have too much voltage, it's gonna explode. And if you, even if you like make sure every single voltage, every single utility of your, when you use this thing is correct, you're gonna wear out the GPIO pins. These are used for logic, these aren't used for power. So again, safe power methods, USB port, VCC ground, and then raw ground, nothing else. Okay, don't, don't touch these and expect it to power itself because it will work. Like if you plug in five volts to nine and ground, it will turn on, but it's not safe. That's why I bolded in red because I've seen this happen before. <laughs> so Arduinos work with five volts TTL. Anyone here know what TTL stands for? TTL stands for transistor, transistor logic. So if you ever hear that word, just mean, it just means like what voltage this thing is comfortable working at. And comfortable ex, ex, uh, putting out of its GPIO pins as well. So if you're working with any like inputs or outputs, it's always gonna output something like five volts, right? That's gonna be its logic level, right? So that means if you're trying to power something with the Arduino out of its GPIO ports, and it's something lower than five volts, you're gonna need to like think of something else because this thing can only export five volts outwards. And that's transistor, transistor logic. So when we're talking about Arduinos, usually we say that five volts is gonna be our high signal, and then zero volts is gonna be our low signal. And anything in between is gonna be a big question mark. Now, it's, like, it's a very, um, like a coin flip onto like actually what happens in the middle of it. It's kind of like a gray area. We don't actually know what goes on in it, so we just don't touch it. So if you try to like, this, this is really important for like inputs, right? If you're trying to measure some sort of signal and it's giving you three volts, it's not gonna be high, it's not gonna be low, it's just gonna be like a question mark. Sometimes it'll be high, sometimes it'll be low. You know, it's a gray area. So, you know, as for, you know, beginners, I just wanna say that five volts is gonna be high signal and zero volts is gonna be low signal. And usually I color code it in like red and green uh, because if you're using some sort of like voltage probe, that's what you're gonna see. Like high signals usually like red. If you're working with things like Raspberry Pi or ESP32, um, those have a 3.3 volt TTL, which means if you're trying to power if you're using a ESP32 or a Raspberry Pi and you're trying to power something that uses five volts, you're not gonna be able to do it, right? You're gonna need some sort of voltage step up circuit, right? It's gonna be very difficult. So Arduinos, five volts, ESP32, Raspberry Pi, 3.3 volts. ESP32 is kind of like Arduino, but it has Wi-Fi. Most basic way of explaining it. Same thing with Raspberry Pi, but that's one's a little bit different. All right, GPIO pins. So GPIO stands for general purpose input and output. So again, all of Arduino relies on the fact that we're taking an inputs to this control board and we're spitting out outputs, right? It's kind of like this black box where like I take in inputs, if something happens here and then an output comes out. That's a basic manual control system or autonomous control system. Any other control system uses some sort of this logic, right? Inputs, something happens and then outputs. And in Arduino, it does it using the GPIO pins. So the pins on the side here to the left and to the right. Everything in blue you see can be used as a digital pin. So digital pin, whenever I say digital, that just, that just means binary, right? It can only be a zero or one. And that's useful for things like switches, buttons, things like that. Um, but it might not be useful for if we want to measure a joystick or a potentiometer, right? Because if you know those like rotating little knobs, they can rotate from like one side to another. And then there's like an in-between state, right? So you can't have like a zero or a one reading from a potentiometer. That you gotta use something different. So for digital pins, there are two actions you can normally do. Basically you can read or you can write. 
So for reading, it's like kind of like reading a book. You're reading the information, right? So in this case, the Arduino will be reading information from like out of it. So it can read information from sensors. It can read information from like inputs, like joysticks and potentiometers. Basically, it's reading information, right? So digital read would kind of be like reading a button. It can also write. And writing is the action of just setting one of these pins to high or low. And high, again, is 5 volts. Low is 0 volts. So when you're setting one of these pins to 5 volts or 0 volts, uh, that's a writing action. And in the Arduino, there's like custom functions you can use to be able to like read and write commands. Now, if you have a potentiometer or one of those like knobs where you can turn from like all the way to the left and all the way to the right, you're going to need something different to read it, which are going to be the analog pins. So the analog pins in this diagram are read in the green. So you have A0, A1, A2, A3, A4. I don't know what, there's no A4. It just goes to A6, A7, A9, and then A10. So for these analog pins, um, they are linked to the microcontroller's ADC. ADC just stands for Analog to Digital Converter, which means from these pins, you can read data that isn't a binary input. Basically, read data that isn't just a 0 or a 1. Read data like you can read temperature data. You can read um, potentiometers, joysticks. I've said that before. Uh, and then you can also read other data as well, like barometer. You can read like telemetry data if you want. Basically, anything that doesn't have a 0 or 1 uh, input to the Arduino. Now, you also have pins called PWM pins. Now, PWM pins are known as pulse width modulation. They're like analog, but for outputs. So pulse width modulation is a write action. So from the Arduino board itself, for the pins where it's red, so 3, 5, 6, 9, and 10, these are going to be locked as what's called PWM. So we'll talk about more of this later, but pretty much what it is, it's faking lower voltage. Basically, it wants to um, output like 3.3 volts, but um, the Arduino can only have 5 volts of the output, right? So it's kind of like faking something, right? But pulse width modulation is also, also really useful for speed control. And it's also, you know, like what you usually hear about when you're designing some sort of UGV. Um, when you guys work on your RC cars later on, you're going to go ahead and use PWM to regulate the speed of your motors because, you know, you're faking a lower voltage for the motors. So that's going to be a write action, and it comes from these pins right here. And you'll notice that some of these pins are both PWN and analog. So they're like fully analog pins where you can read analog signals and also write analog signals outwards. So there's communication protocol pins, and we won't go into in depth for this because it's a bit advanced. There are sensors and tools that we're going to be using today that do use these sort of like signals, but um, you don't have to know the exact science behind them yet. Just know they transfer data back and forth really, really cool. And the, um, so for UART, SPI, and I2C, um, you, you'll see them as like SD, SCL for I2C, or I squared C. Uh, you can RSTS for UART, and then you have S clock, MISO, and MOSI for SPI. So those are the pins you're going to use for that. Okay, I think I explained ADC a little bit, but here we're gonna go ahead and do it in more depth. So ADC pins are the ones highlighted in green. They are known as the analog to digital converter. And this is used to measure changing voltage signals. So one of the uh, first things I have uh, some people in my project do uh, when I lead a project is I have them build like a voltage uh, detector for like an Arduino, basically a multimeter, but for an Arduino. And you have to use the ADC pins to do so because basically what it does is it changes this voltage signal between zero and five volts and maps it into a ADC value depending on the board's resolution. Now, what the heck do I mean by that? Basically, it just turns the voltage into any number between zero and 1023, like spaced equally depending on the voltage. I wish I had a picture here. Basically, it's like if there's two timelines, you had like zero to five volts on like the top timeline and then zero to 1023 on the bottom timeline, and they just map to each other perfectly. So that's, a, that's what the ADC usually does. Um, and you can also modify the resolution. Basically, the resolution is the sensitivity of the detection. So whether the uh, 1023 is called 10-bit resolution, right, because it's 2 to the power of 10. If you want a lower resolution, like let's say 8-bit resolution, that's 2 to the power of 8, which is 255, right? So the lower resolution you go, it's like kind of like looking at a uh, video on YouTube, right? If you get lower resolution, everything becomes super blurry and like it's not clear, right? Higher resolution, you're like, wow, this looks like real life. It's kind of the same thing for Arduino, but like for value. So when you're doing experiments and you want a higher value or a higher accuracy of a value, you would look towards a higher resolution. Same with measuring voltage. 
So this is used to read potentiometer and joystick values on a controller. Now, a potentiometer is a simple voltage divider. Uh, it's made of like two resistors. So basically, when you turn the knob, it changes the resistance. And so pretty much what it does is it feeds a voltage signal into the Arduino, right? And so based on this potentiometer, the potentiometer is able to send a value between 0 and 1,023 inside the Arduino Pro Micro. And it depends on how, you know, like right to or left um, the potentiometer changes. Joystick is pretty much the same thing. A joystick, like an Xbox joystick, is two potentiometers, right? One in the X axis and one in the Y axis. So it's pretty self-explanatory as to how these two are usually talked about together. And on your controllers, there will be both of these things. And you will have to write some code in order to allow the Arduino Pro Micro to detect these two objects. So the importance of resolution is really important. Um, maybe not for like this lab, but let me give you like, like an example. So if I had a resolution, uh, if I had like a temperature sensor and I was measuring the temperature of the room, if I had a really low resolution, basically it could only tell me like the room is like 60 or 70 degrees, right? Which is like, it's not good because I want to know if it's in between, right? What if my 3D printers will break at exactly 64 degrees Fahrenheit? And I really need to know that, but my sensor doesn't give me that accurate of a value. Now, if I uh, increase the resolution at which this temperature sensor is being read from this Arduino, then it can give me values like 61, 62, 63, 64, all the way to 70. So it's more specific, right? You get more numbers the more you go up the resolution. And of course, everyone wants infinite resolution, right? But you know, that's just not possible because the more resolution you have, the more processing power you're going to need on your Arduino as well. And let me tell you guys this. Arduinos don't have much processing power. They're not a computer. Basically, you can't run Minecraft on it, although you can definitely try. Um, it has 32 kilobytes of RAM, so basically not enough to even like run Word, right? So it's not that strong, but it's really useful for like beginners because you can then step up the skills. They're applicable to a lot of things. So um, again, anything you pass into the analog pin has to be regulated between zero and five volts. Otherwise, boom, explosion. And I don't know if you guys have ever worked with an Arduino, and I hope this doesn't happen today, but like the puff of smoke that comes from like the Arduino's chip, you just like feel it inside you. You're like, oh God, $8 down the drain. Now this thing is $8 by the way. <laughs> and like during setup, we already destroyed like five of them. So yeah, like I said before, note that some pins are also PWM capable, right? They can be both analog read and analog write. All right, let's talk about pulse width modulation. Oh, I don't have the fancy transitions in this slide. Okay, pulse width modulation is basically modifying the width of a pulse. I know that sounds like self-intuitive and all, uh, but it's used to write an output signal to an LED motor or other driver circuit. So pretty much what, what's gonna happen is, let's say you're turning on LED, and when you get to the controller section in a few minutes, you're gonna say, um, the chair if you wanna sit on yeah. Um, it, when you get to the controller section, you're gonna be like, oh, it's really bright, right? Um, the LED is really bright. And how do I lower the brightness of this LED here? And to lower the brightness of the LED, one obvious thing you might do is turn down the voltage. Because the lower voltage you have through an LED, the you know, less of a brightness it will have. But for an Arduino, how do you lower the brightness of an LED if the output of this pin is always going to be 5 volts? You know, there's a saying where you say, like, fake it till you make it. Same thing for an Arduino. It's going to fake the voltage by basically um, modifying the pulse. It's going to go ahead. I do have a picture. Yes, I do. Okay, cool. So basically, we're going to have, uh, you know, I'm not going to go into really detail what PWM is, but basically you have a low and high signal, and PWM oscillates between that low and high signal. And basically, the, the width of that pulse, uh, whether it's like really thin, like 10%, or really thick, like 90%, is going to determine what voltage the Arduino sees. So pretty much what happens is it oscillates at this, uh, you know, frequency um, really fast, so that the Arduino doesn't see zero volts, it doesn't see five volts, but it outputs something like 3.2 volts. And that's known as VRMS, the voltage root mean squared. So basically, it's faking a voltage by just like oscillating between zero and five volts really fast. Yes? Yeah, so VRMS is sort of like the average, like it's a root mean, which mean means average squared. So there's a more complicated equation that I won't go into, but if you want to look into it, uh, I left a lot of links on this PowerPoint. So after the workshop, you can go ahead and take a look back and just read into it at your heart's content. 
But pretty much what we're saying is this works for LEDs. Basically, you can lower the brightness by lowering the voltage. This works for motors. You can lower the speed of the motor by lowering its voltage, right? So any output you're working with, PWM is really useful if you want to regulate some sort of like speed, brightness, or other like quantitative quality. All right, we're on section three. There's seven sections, remember that. <laughs> so we're going to software, which, you know, today's lab is all going to be about software. Um, there's not going to be any much hardware because we do have a lot of people here and we don't want you guys blowing up Arduinos left and right. So it's mostly going to be a programming workshop. So uh, buckle up and let's do some software. There is going to be hardware components though. So do be fair warned. Okay. So for software, the first command, oh, 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 oh. the first thing we're going to be talking about is the coding language. So what coding language is Arduino written in? Uh, I hid the text, but you can see the picture. So it's not really a surprise, but you know, it's a fusion of C and C++, which means there's C commands and there's C++ commands. And then there's also Arduino-based commands as well. So some extra commands that allow you to interface with the Arduino GPIO pins. Now, more complicated boards will go ahead and use something like MicroPython. The ESP32 uses MicroPython. Um, I don't really like it because it's kind of like a dumber version of Python. But if you're wanting to code in Python, but you don't want to learn C, I guess you can do that. <laughs> Um, Arduino has special high-level functions that work with the GPIO, ADC, and PWM pins. So if you were working with like, or if you have taken like C for engineers or any other coding class here, you'll realize that normal coding, you know, it's just like if statements, loops, functions, it's pretty simple stuff like that. Arduino is the same thing, except there's like more. Now you have to like work with physical objects. You have to work with the input and output pins in order to, you know, control something in the real world. So we're moving from like, software based into the real world. And that's why when we're controlling the RC cars today, you're going to be actually physically using them um, with your programming skills. So interfacing, that's the word. Let's talk about timing paradigms. Now, it's evident I just didn't screw this in tight enough. But the word paradigm just means pattern. It's a fancy way of saying pattern. So if you ever want to go ahead and impress an interviewer, just say, I know what timing paradigms are in Arduino. So. In Arduino, usually there's three different sections in which you have to code in. The first section is going to be your variable definition. So you want to define any variables, you put that at the very, very top of your code. It's kind of like C or any other programming language. If you want to define a variable, you put it at the very, very top. What also goes to the very, very top? Libraries. So if you want to import any libraries, you also do it at the very, very top. The next section, oh, OK, I have a comment here. So it says define all your library installation, variables, pin locations, and class setups in this location. So section two is what's known as setup. Now, Arduino does something called the start update paradigm. If you want to call it setup loop paradigm, you can too. But all it means is that inside the setup function, you're going to run it once at the beginning of the code. Whenever you open a brand new Arduino file, it always says this. Put your setup code here to run once. And then in loop, it says something else. But for setup, it'll run once. So inside the setup, um, you're going to go ahead and set up your initial conditions and also any parameters that you have set. You can begin your serial monitor. You can go ahead and have initial conditions, you know, things like that. So it also is really important. This setup function is really important. Let me give you an example. So a few years back, I was working on a project that involves some sort of like vehicle. And back then, I was a noob at coding. It was my first year of working with Arduino, and I didn't know about this thing. So um, the reason why initial conditions are so important and why you have them run once is because if you, have, if you have something like an RC car and you want it to not move when you like first program it, you would want to like say that in the setup function, right? Else, you would be me. You wouldn't do that. And the minute you program your car, it's just going to go racing off into the distance because apparently like its initial condition was one for some reason. And then um, it would crash to a wall, explode into smithereens, and you'd spend your next two weeks working on it. But you know, I digress. You set up, right? So initial conditions are very important. And um, in the code itself, in the skeleton code, make sure you guys put, um, you know, set all your motors to zero at the beginning of the script. Uh, by zero, I mean, like, make sure they don't move when you program your code. The third section is loop. Now, loop is probably, like, the most important one uh, because, you know, it runs infinitely. Whenever you power a microcontroller, it's going to run on a clock, right? And this, as long as you power the microcontroller, you're going to get an oscillating signal. You're going to get, um, you're going to get, like, it running, uh, running again and again and again until it loses power. Right? If you're having it plug into a wall, it's going like, to do this forever. So it's really awesome. Um, and you know, this is the meat of the code. This is where like, everything, all the logic happens. So it's awesome. 
By the way, can you guys hear me in the back? Yes? I realize now I'm looking at Siobhan. I forgot to put the speakerphone on. But I think it's good because the, the microphone can then pick up my voice. And it's not echoey. So I talk loud, so that's OK. <laughs> yeah. So here's the thing, right? In the loop function, your variables aren't saved. Basically, if you create any variable inside the loop, the time it like loops again to the top, your, that variable is going to be gone. So for the most parts, you want to create a variable in the setup and then use it like at the rest of the code, or as you said, create a global variable, right? Otherwise, because this thing, after it you know passes, that variable is going to be gone. It's going to go into like the garbage dump or whatever the memory collector is called in C. Good question. Okay, uh, it's five thirty nine, so I'm going to speed through this next part. But pretty much here is like a lot of like you know, functions that you have to use. This first one is called define. So it's kind of like the variable definition inside of Arduino. It's kind of like how you name a constant variable. Uh, or if you, if you want to name a constant value in C, use define. But in this case, we're using Arduino, which you know, I sure hope that you know, if you assign a GPIO pin to a variable, it doesn't change, right? Because you don't change a GPIO variable in, in the middle of your code. Because that means you have to change your hardware, too. That's kind of confusing. So a constant value always has the word defined before it. And we use defined to define, literally, things that we use GPIO pins. So like if we connect an LED to a GPIO pin, we need to use define. If we connect a motor to a GPIO pin, we use define. Any single connection you make to the Arduino, you're going to have to like specify it inside the GPIO pin um, and use const. Here's the syntax. Here's the example. We're moving on. So inside the code, you're going to see like a bunch of these things. Basically, they are what maps the um, it's what maps the hardware to the software. Pretty much, you know, this is going to say define in one L. So in one L is going to represent one of the motor drivers you're going to be working with, and you're going to have to find exactly what that's connected to in the hardware. So I think if um, they have everything set up there, they're going to give that to you, but your job is just to type it in. Basically, there's a lot of these, right? Because we're driving a motor. And so um, same thing for the top there, except this is the controller. I've already done this for you because you, know, you can't just like peek inside and take a look at all the wiring. It's a mess. It's a PCB. So in this case, I have defined the digital joysticks. You have all digital inputs. Everything is already done for you. And so like things like RPOT, that just means the right potentiometer is connected to pin A7. So whenever you use something in the code, like let's say you want to read from this right potentiometer, then you're going to go, OK, I'm going to do analog. I'm going to do read. And then from A7, and it's going to give you that value, right? Pin mode. Let's talk about pin mode. Pin mode is something you use in your setup function. Pretty much what it does is it specifies whether a pin is an input or output. Now, here's the thing. When you're coding in Arduino, it doesn't know what the heck it is, what the heck you're plugging it in. It doesn't know whether it's an input or an output. It's just confused. So you have to tell it what it is. And so if you're plugging in something like a sensor, right? Let's say you're plugging in a light sensor or ultrasonic sensor into the Arduino. You're going to use input, right? Because, or ultrasonic is a little bit different, but you know, like an, an LED. Uh, sorry, no, an IR sensor. So a sensor that detects light, that would be an input, right? Something like an LED or a motor, that would be an output. So you have to really like, be careful about what you're plugging into the controller because you know, if you specify this wrong, it might blow up. I'll say this again and again, but like, there's a lot of things you can do that just destroys the Arduino. I'm not scaring you because. Um, I want to scare you. It's because it's probably going to happen to you. And when that happens, you know, it's OK. Um, don't be scared. It happens to everyone. <laughs> if you're working with Arduinos, at some point in your life, you're going to miss a connection, and you're going to blow it up. Um, you know, Arduinos used to be relatively cheap, so that wouldn't be a problem. But now they're $8. That's like 30 minutes of work. So that's why we're having this lecture, just so we, you can be careful when you're actually working with this stuff. OK. So inputs are like switches, potentiometers, joystick sensors. Outputs are like LEDs, motors, drivers, general output signals. I just put general output signals because if you want to have some like uh, signal to control a circuit, like in one of my projects right now, they're making a wireless induction circuit and they're using an Arduino to uh, act as the clock. So just anything you want a voltage signal to is going to be fall under general output. Syntax for this here, example here. I'm not going to go too deep into this because I'm going to give you the PowerPoint later on. It's going to have all of it. Um, 
For pin mode, you can reference it using the variable name if you have define. Let's say in the beginning you have define LED pin, and then here you have 13, right? You can reference it by the pin number or the variable that you assign it to. So, you know, when we're talking about code, usually we want to make our code readable to other people. And so if you just have a bunch of numbers in your code, it's going to be really hard to read. That's why I don't like assembly. Too many numbers, too many instructions. But, you know, so this is readable. This is not, but they both work. Oh, examples, yay. So here is the um, GPIO pin setup for the L298 uh, motor drivers. So basically the RC car that you've been programming in. Basically all of these uh, control pins are going to set to outputs, right? In the uh, controller you have, all of these pin modes are input pull-ups. Now you gotta be careful. We're gonna be talk talking about input pull-up in a bit. But if you have a switch or a button, make sure you use input pull-up. Do not connect the switch directly into the Arduino. Because what will happen if you don't have input pull-up and you connect the switch directly into the Arduino and then the other side to ground, you're going to create a short circuit. And so what input pull-up does is it prevents that. So this is a little diagram I have on the side here. But pretty much what happens is you have your switch outside the Arduino. You have a logic gate here. And then you have a pull-up resistor to 5 volts. right? And internally inside the Arduino, there's a multiplexer. Uh, multiplexer is just a fancy name for a switch. Basically, it switches the signal to input pull-up. Basically, it puts a resistor between that signal and the in. Reason being, if this switch is connected, right? If this switch is connected, the current's gonna go from this node down to ground because current flows the path of least resistance. And this V out's gonna see zero volts, right? So the switch is connected, it's gonna see zero volts, basically zero meaning low. Now this switch is disconnected. What happens is that this connection is not here anymore, which means all your current is gonna go from V in is straight into the microcontroller. And it's going to say that, okay, the microcontroller now sees five volts. So a switch is just a way for the microcontroller to see like a one or a zero. But here's just some like basic circuitry you gotta know before you start connecting a switch because you can't connect it directly or else it'll blow up. I, I mean, I'm gonna say that as the consequence of like every single mishap we do in Arduino. But in reality, like, Arduino is pretty like, it's pretty like sturdy. You can, you can like do many things with it and it'll still be fine. Like it has reverse polarity protection. That's kind of, kind of like one of the star features of Arduino is if you somehow mess up and connect the red pin to the black line and the black line, black pin to the red line, basically you switch power and ground. The Arduino is going to survive. The rest of your components, maybe not, but Arduino will survive. It has good protection against that. Okay. Digital write, digital read. Okay. So, Writing, again, digital write is going to be used to write a 5 volts, which is a high signal, or a 0 volt signal to a pin. It's used for outputs. Again, outputs are things like LEDs, motors, things that we can turn on with Arduino, right? Uh, here's the example of how you use it. Digital read is kind of like reading a book, right? The Arduino is going to read some sort of instruction. You want to make sure um, your input is going to deliver a high or low signal. Because if it delivers an analog signal, and when I say analog, it just means like it's not zero or one. It's zero, one, and everything in between, basically. Um, if it's an analog input, it's not going to work. So you want to make sure it's a digital, right? This is good for reading switches and buttons. And on your controller, you're going to see that as very true, right? Because you're going to be programming this stuff in, right? I, I left it blank for you guys. Um, not here, so maybe you can copy off the PowerPoint. But uh, in, inside the lab, I wrote skeleton code for you guys, basically. So some of it's there, some of it's not. You just got to fill in the blanks and hope it's right. So digital reads, you see, read a higher low signal from an input. You can store the return value of this inside a variable for future use. Because it returns you a one or a zero, you can go ahead and do something like int switch value equals to digital read 13. Um, if you guys have never coded before, this int right here stands for integer. So basically, you're defining what the variable's characteristics is. Switch value is the name. And then this is the function. Dang it. Oh, OK. It automatically advanced the slide for me. Okay, let's talk about analog read and write. Here I have my uh, good old PWM diagram again. Uh, let's go ahead this is here. So analog write, uh, if I use analog write, what's going to happen is it's got to be on a PWM pin. So one of those red check marks you saw in the previous image, it's got to be on one of those pins. Otherwise, it's not going to work, right? And what happens is that you can go ahead and reference a pin name and then specify a value between 0 and 1024. And based on this value, it's going to output you a signal that looks kind of like this. 
right? If you take an oscilloscope or other measuring tool and you put it to the pin and you set one of these like signals like analog right 127, this is going to give you a clock signal. Basically, it's, this is going to mimic, you know, 2.5 volts because it's just 5 volts divided by 2. But based on the result of your analog right, it's going to go ahead and provide you a value. So it's used to write PWM signals to a pin, and it's often used for outputs. Uh, example of like regulating speed of the RC car motors, uh, something like this. You can also do analog write, write LED pin high, by the way. Um, so analog pins are also digital pins. So uh, most of the time when you're using something like an Arduino Pro Micro, you're not going to have enough digital pins, just like bare bones digital pins. So you're going to have to use the multiplexing feature in order to get more things. And for the most part, what I do is I literally just use an analog pin as a digital pin to do that. High is just this, right? It's just a one signal. It's just like five volts. OK, analog read. When we're doing analog read, again, we are trying to figure out you know, the value of a potentiometer, the value of a joystick, or the value of anything that gives the Arduino value that's not 0 and 1. right? So anything variable, anything that varies voltage. By the way, a cool thing you can do, and um, I've done this before just for fun, but if you connect just a bare bones wire, just like a naked wire, to the A0 pin of an Arduino, and you wave it around in the air, you can actually read some voltage from the air. This is especially true if you want to find things like hidden cameras, if you want to th find things like hidden power outlets. It's kind of like something that detects voltage, right? It's kind of like a metal detector, but easy. So the naked wire senses the voltage, and that voltage goes into the a ADC, which turns it into a number. So it's used to be, uh, read a varying voltage signal from an input, uses Arduino ADC to convert the voltage value into a number, uh, and here's the example. So we talked about digital, we talked about analog, they both have read or write, it's both in like different locations, and um, you're going to have to use all of them <laughs> inside the lab. I somehow turned my microphone like 180 degrees around. This recording's not going to come out well. <laughs> okay, let's talk about resolution. So I already spoke about resolution a little bit at the beginning, um, but what happens is that you, resolution is pretty much how sensitive your, uh, your detection method is. So whenever you're using some sort of Arduino or some other sort of system, you want to make sure you check the data sheet. Because checking the data sheet, it'll show you exactly how many bits the ADC or PWM is for the Arduino. So in this case, an Arduino Pro Micro has a 10-bit ADC and an 8-bit PWM. And you don't have to memorize it like I did. I've just gotten enough PTSD from uh, working with Arduino to like, know that by hand, like at the back of my hand. Uh, so 10-bit ADC just means that the Arduino can give back a value to you between 0 and 1,023. And then 8-bit PWM means it can write out an analog value between 0 and 255. If you want anything more sensitive than that, you can increase the resolution. But that will have to deal with like timers, bit shifting, and way more advanced stuff than I would like to talk about today. This is already advanced. So here's the thing. The, the reason why I'm showing you guys this is because when you're coding the actual program, you have to be very careful. Now, here's the issue. The controller, like my RC controller here, is going to read a 10-bit ADC value from the inputs. So the joystick is going to give it a value between 0 and 1,023. The potentiometer is going to give the Arduino a value between 1,023. Now, here's the thing. This thing has to travel through the air wirelessly, which is super cool. It's magic. Basically, there is a little antenna on the controller that outputs a radio frequency signal all the way across the room, right? Now, this you know, radio stick here can only transfer things that are 8 bits. Basically, each little channel that it has has one byte of maximum data, and one byte is 8 bits. So how am I going to go ahead and stuff this 10-bit ADC value, which is humongous, right? Think of it as like 10 different people going into a hotel. And the hotel is saying, oh, no, it's only meant one room is meant for 8 people. So how are you going to stuff 10 people into like 8 bits of data? Usually don't. That's a bad analogy. But in this case, um, what happens is that we need to find an alternate solution. So it's a real world problem because it happened in the controller. And you're not going to be able to get an accurate value if you don't do this correctly. Does anyone know what operation I'm talking about in order to transfer some value from eight, 10 bits to 8 bits? There are two things you can do. One thing is significantly easier than the other, but it's also really bad. <laughs> but we do it because it's easy. So let's talk about mapping. Mapping is the action of transforming a number from one range 
or such resolution to another. So basically, we're taking a number from the 10-bit range and putting it down to the 8-bit range. Now, the, the, the bad thing about doing this is that you lose out on resolution, but it's easy. So this image describes it pretty well. So pretend this is like the lower range. Basically, this is like 8-bit. Um, and you have from 0 to the maximum of 8-bit, right? Down here is the higher resolution. There's more numbers here, so you can go way more sensitive across this number line. And this goes from 0 to 1,000, right? So the way mapping works is we basically take a number from the top here, let's say 20, and we basically align it with the number line on the bottom. On the bottom, in this range, the number is 200. But on the top, it's only 20, right? So due to this mapping, we are able to you know, transfer this data packet from our controller over to the other side. Because now, we basically chopped our number down from 10 bits into 8 bits. And now, you know, our controller likes it. Here's the syntax for it. So the mapping function will take a value, and it'll transform it from the old range, so old low and old high, to new low and new high. And the example here is actually what you just need. So if, if I'm trying to transfer a potentiometer value across the 8-bit uh, you know, channel, then I'm going to have a pot valve. My old range is going to be from 0 to 1,023, because that's ADC. My new range is going to be from 0 to 255, because that's 8-bit. And then it's going to go ahead and just transfer that. So value is now going to contain some value of the potentiometer that actually allows me to uh, transfer this across my wireless radio technology. Now, there is another way to do this, and it's much more efficient, but also uh, it's much more complicated. If you're interested, you can let me know, and I'll tell you. Include. So today, we're going to be using a lot of libraries. Now, the reason we use libraries inside Arduino is to gain access to high-level functions um, that can control things like the OLED, the NRF24L01, and other complicated sensors that you don't want to like, you know, do yourself. Because something like a temperature sensor you can't really like transfer that into a signal. You've got to like do some hard math, like quantization, turning it into from one resolution to another, uh, and then like doing all sorts of like addressing just to get a single value. And that's really hard, right? So we have other people do it for us, and we just use their functions. That's what include does. We can use external libraries for high-level functions in the project. So most sensors that you use, if you're doing any sort of project in the future, and I do encourage you to try to do that because you know sensors are really useful. Search online. Someone has got to have a library that takes this, um, that basically just minimizes the work of reading from the sensor down into like one line of code. So example, this wire.h library is used like it very much in the world because wire.h allows you to read I2C signals, right? And basically I2C is a communication protocol that allows you to transfer data really quickly. It's one of the fastest transferring protocols there is. Or I2C, whatever you want to call it, right? But you know, I squared C, if you're trying to like control like an OLED, and OLED is basically a screen, you can't just like digital write each pixel out, right? That's like not efficient. So they have libraries in which you can just do this in one line. Syntax is just include library name. And then example is like include wire.h, something like that. Right. This is what it looks like in the code. Basically, you have hashtag include, and then you put it in like the greater than, less than symbols, and then your library in between. These are the libraries you're going to use for the lab. So I would suggest maybe like you or someone in your team have this downloaded um, just to make sure you know, we're all ready to code. Because the code will not run without these. Um, SPI is just used for SPI communication. It's another communication protocol. It's used for reading data from the NRF24L01 sensor. Um, Adafruit GFX and this Adafruit SSD1306 thing is used for reading the OLED and writing to the OLED. Yes? No. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you what's, what's up next. So we use a lot of libraries here, right? It's really complicated. Um, it's really nuts. Uh, so here's the thing. SPI and wire.h already comes with Arduino. So when you initially download Arduino, it's already there, right? The two libraries you need to download is the RF24 library and then the SSD1306. So these two libraries, you would go into your tools and then manage libraries and just search for them in like the search bar, right? And then just download these into your code and then you're all set. It doesn't take long, it takes like two minutes max. So I would just do it like in the lab, but these are the two ones you'll need. This one is for wireless communication. This one's for OLED, basically digital screen. 
I know this is like an introductory Arduino workshop, but we're we're already on like displays, <laughs> so that's fun. Um, okay, so I'll put the PowerPoint on the Discord server, and you guys can reference it later. But now we have the struct. Now struct is kind of like an array, but it's cooler because you don't have to like access each. Yes. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, so the struct is a data structure that's really cool in Arduino because it allows you to access different elements of the struct by just calling its name, right? So in an array, you have to access the elements by saying like i equals one, i equals two. Like the index is what's used to reference the element. Struct, no. You can just go ahead and create the structure, right? You can reference it as some sort of like variable like here. And then all you do to like reference the values or to put new values in is you just use packet or like whatever your name is, dots, and then the value inside of it. Now, if you're like me and we made this controller that we had so many values inside, it's really easier for us to use this sort of like assign in, right? Because if you use an array, it's just gonna be like, okay, let's say packet, and then like button left is gonna be like one, two, three, four, five, like six down, and it's gonna be really confusing through the code. Yes. Similar to that, yes. Uh, where you can store different elements inside, but this is more or less directed towards C uh, because it's very good for memory allocation. Yeah, so C and C++, they have sort of this like structure because they, they don't have like, they don't have, uh, their arrays are immutable, basically. So once you make the array, it's really hard to change the uh, size or value of it. So this is used inside the code to create an easier method of transferring data from the transmitter to the receiver. All right, we're on section four. We're gonna talk about outputs now. And these, these are gonna be the outputs that we're gonna use inside the lab itself um, in order to you know, drive the RC car. The first one is LED. Now you're actually not gonna use an LED today, which is like surprising because literally every single initial Arduino workshop uses an LED. But um, I'm just gonna explain how you can use an Arduino to control it. And we're gonna move on from there. So an LED is a basic electronic component. If you pass a voltage signal from the positive end to the negative end, and it's gonna be a positive voltage, this thing's gonna turn on, right? It's pretty self-explanatory. You pass a voltage signal, it turns on. Now, the LED physically has two leads or two legs, right? The longer leg is gonna be the plus end. The shorter leg is gonna be the minus end. We talked about this a lot during the soldering workshop, so this should be stuck in your brain. But you know, once again, longer leg is gonna be the plus end, shorter leg is gonna be the minus end, right? And uh, it's, ref it's referenced inside the code as a diode. So LEDs are polarized, which means direction matters. If it doesn't turn on and you don't know why, you're probably flipping it backwards. That's the most common error, right? So you wanna make sure that your voltage is always going from the positive to negative uh, pin. So for the most part, there's gonna be a bit of a uh, warning. Um, for the most part, when you connect an LED to an Arduino directly, and this is for applications with an Arduino, you know, it's not gonna blow up if you don't have any resistance because I, I think um, all LED circuits advise you to use a resistor and I completely agree. But Arduino is not going to kill the LED necessarily because A, the Arduino has input re internal resistors and B, the Arduino doesn't like output that much current. From its GPIO pins, I think it's like regulated 50 milliamps to like 500 milliamps of current, but it's not going to like hurt the LED as if you just connect it across a power source. So use a resistor to be with, across the LED to be safe but the Arduino will protect you if you're trying to turn on one of these things with an Arduino. Um, especially if you're just trying to do some like Christmas lights um, or if you're going to do one of those things where you like put addressable LEDs under your desk and make it shiny. Um, those are like just something different than LEDs because they require external power. LEDs, in fact, drain a lot of current, surprisingly, right? So you want to be careful how you use them. I mean, they're light. It's got to come from somewhere. So make sure you always use a resistor. I recommend for like five volts, either go with a 330 ohm or a one kilo ohm resistor, depending on the color of the LED. Because different color LEDs have different voltage drops. And you know, if you wanna look up a table about them, you can. Uh, pretty much what I did for the controller is I misjudged that severely. I used a blue LED with a 330 ohm resistor. And let's just say uh, the controller is a little bright. It's not blindingly bright, like my first blinky learner, but it's like a little bright. So here's a caution warning. The most common error for an LED is connecting it backwards. So especially in the future, if you work with Arduino, if your LED is not running properly and you're certain that you did everything right, just flip it around because it might be backwards. 
It's happened to me before. It's happened to a lot of people I've seen before. It's very common error. Just know it exists. Let's talk about motors. Everyone in the back still hear me okay? OK, good. So motors. Oh, OK. Motors are really useful when you're doing like some sort of car, because it's what drives the car, right? It's what makes the wheels turn. So pretty much what happens is you pass a voltage through a motor. Oop. You pass a voltage through the motor, and it spins. So motors are made of coil of wire internally that utilize the energy from magnetic fields to spin. It's an inductor, basically, if you know what that is. If you don't want to know what that is, you're OK. Pretty much what you're, what you're all you're concerned about is if you pass a voltage through it, no matter which direction it goes, you know, it'll spin. Now, the thing about motors is if you flip the wires, nothing will happen. Only, actually, something will happen. It'll go from like clockwise spinning to counterclockwise spinning, depending on which direction you have your motors. Right? Same for like H bridge. So, you know, when you're going to and playing with your RC car like later on, make sure you have some sort of calibration script because some of the motors may be flipped. And we're not sure which ones are which. So, connecting a motor backwards will turn it backwards, uh, which may go from like clockwise to counterclockwise or counterclockwise to, to clockwise. And the cars that you'll be playing with are four wheel drive, which means that all four wheels are spinning independently of each other. And all four wheels are connected to a motor driver. So you'll have to do some calibration just to make sure when you're like pushing your stick forward, it doesn't just like go backwards instead, right? So be careful of that. So most of the time, motors require more than five volts to turn on in most cases. If you are at the circuit analysis workshop, we talked about H bridges and more of the circuit methods in order to step up voltage in order to power motors that require a higher amount of voltage. Um, and this one here is called the NMOS isolation circuit. So you can use an NMOS as a voltage switch in order to get more voltage to the motor. But in this case, if you're trying to turn on a motor with an Arduino, again, know that it will work to some extent. Right, because check the data sheet of the motor. Usually it needs like nine to 12 volts. This really small ones are five volt rated. But even for the five volt rated ones, you wanna be careful because you know, Arduino can't output that much current, especially from the GPIO pins. So you wanna use some like external driver or external power as I like to call it, to power these motors up. And then you'll build one of these circuits or you'll use what we're gonna talk about next in order to act as a bridge between your control system and your motors. Okay, these are like the most popular things I've ever seen. And they're like getting more and more expensive throughout these days. This is the L298 motor driver. It's old, but it's the most popular motor driver out there. It can change the motor direction based on two digital inputs. So um, in this case, I listed everything on this slide. Um, the power constraints you need to know is that you can only pass in, well, it's up to 12 volts actually, not five volts, but two amps is correct. Basically you can't draw more than two amps from it. So your motor can't be like really thick and powerful like the ones Formula SAE uses, because those won't work, right? You gotta make sure you limit the current. Now here are the pins of the um, l 2 motor driver. Pins in one through in four, right here, these control motor direction. And you can look at here at this table to exact, see exactly like which direction it'll turn, right? So let's say in one, in two is zero, zero, and then motor is stopped. You know, this state is going to be bricks. So if you want your car to stop initially, you want to make sure you set in one to zero and in two to zero, right? In one and in, in one to in four also connect to your Arduino because these are the control pins. So depending on what the Arduino sends to this kind of driver, the outputs are going to change. And so that's the question. For in one and in two, these are the outputs of the L298. But for the Arduino, the Arduino sees them as an input. Right? So the input is going to be um, in one, in two, in three, and four. And then we also have two external ones right here, E and A and E and B, right? So these external pins are known as the enable pins. The enable pins basically allow you to stop the motor entirely and not, basically regardless of what in one and in two are, the enable pin is going to be very questionable in terms of like what state it is in. So in this case, E and A is going to be zero, motor is off, but if E and A is one, it's going to read whatever this truth table means. Now, E and A, although it's an enable pin, it's most commonly used for pulse width modulation, basically speed control. We are able to regulate the speed by you know, flipping this enable pin on and off really quickly. Right? So in this case, um, what we're going to do is we are going to go ahead and feed a PWM signal into the enable pins, and it's either going to slow down or you know, like speed of the motor. Because the PWM, again, 
it fakes the voltage, right? So in this case, instead of having five volts directly into the motor, you can have like 2.5 volts, and now it make it slower. Out one to out four is where you plug the motor into, right? So these two terminal blocks out to the side, that's where the motor is connected to. And so the motor will usually have a red and black pin, and those red and black pins will be connected into the motor driver itself. And also the last thing is 12 volts ground and five volts is where you plug external power into, right? So 12 volts ground and five volts, external power. 12 volts is for your main power source, right? So like 12 volts or something. Five volts is where you can get power from. So if you want to power your Arduino with, and you have sort of like a 12 volt power source, you don't want to directly connect your 12 volt battery into the Arduino because it won't like that. It's too high of a voltage and the regulator will be struggling. So what you just should do instead is plug the 12 volts into this sort of module here and then get the five volts and plug this into the Arduino. Because what this will do is it will make it more comfortable, basically. It's not gonna be at the brink of explosion. The regulator on this uh, L290 module right here, this little chip regulates the voltage down to five volts for you. And then ground, always make sure you connect the ground to your Arduino as well, because that's known as common ground. You wanna make sure that all the electronics happening on the L298 are connected with the Arduino. And if you don't have common ground, it's not gonna do that, right? So always make sure the ground is also connected to the Arduino. All right, every RC car, uh, that's given to you today will have two of these things uh, because they are going to be um, four wheel drive. So each one of these L298 motor drivers can control two motors. So, you know, two of these things would get you four motor controls. Right? And again, you can individually control each of the four motors. So you can do things like spin in one place, right? If two motors go forward, two motors go backwards, you're just basically spinning, right? Um, so you want to make sure when you're coding it that your constraints are right. All right. This one's fun. So a lot of times um, when you're coding, right, troubleshooting is a huge step. It's a huge process. And when you're troubleshooting, you're just trying to find out what is wrong. A lot of times when people start with Arduino, they used to do like a simple like serial.print hello world into the serial monitor, right? Now this is different from coding, right? Because that hello world actually comes from the Arduino itself. The Arduino is saying hello world, it's traveling through the wire that connects the Arduino to the computer, and then on the computer it displays you hello world. Um, but in this case, sometimes doing it on a serial monitor is boring. Sometimes you want to actually want to debug it in real life. Sometimes you, actually, sometimes you actually want the Arduino to be able to tell you things, like data and whatnot, out in the real world. So like if you're building something like a remote UGV, and you want to see what the Arduino is saying, you would use some module like this in order to show it, right? So this is kind of like your computer screen or your computer monitor. It's a literal screen, which means that it has a resolution, right? Uh, this specific module right here um, is 640 by 320 pixels. So basically, whatever happens in the Arduino, it needs to export 640 by 320 pixels outwards and control every single one of these pixels to say a specific message. Um, there are two different modules here. You'll find them on Amazon if you Google like OLED. You're going to find some sort of module here. Um, the top one is known as the SPI communication. I hate it. The reason being, there are a whole lot of pins, and I don't want to connect them all. So although this may be faster, it uses more pins, and it's just like troublesome, which is why this is my favorite friend here. I have like 50 of these in my, in my cabinet. These are the um, I2C powered OLEDs. Basically, it uses the um, SCL and SDA pin in order to communicate with the Arduino. So the Arduino will do a bunch of hard math, Basically, if you want to say, like, display hello world, um, the Arduino will go inside, crunch all the numbers for you, export that signal directly into this OLED, and then it'll say hello world. So the library that allows you to do this and makes it possible is the Adafruit SSD1306.h, right? And here's some sample code that allows you to display something on the OLED. Now, you don't have to worry about wiring uh, for today's example because it's already wired for you. But pretty much what happens is um, these are pretty much the commands you need to know in order to display something on the OLED. Now, when you're coding on Arduino, just remember, remember that you have to uh, oblige by the start update paradigm, which means update or loop is going to run infinitely, right? So it's always going to run through this script over and over and over and over again. It's not just going to run through it once, right? So whenever you code, just remember, it's going to run over and over and over and over again, which is why this command is really important. This first command is known as the clear display command. Basically what it does is after you code, after you finish coding and you display something on the screen, once it loops back to the top, you don't want it to overwrite what it already, already has. So this clear, just 
clears everything on the screen so that you can rewrite the same thing or a different thing to the OLED. A display.set text two just sets the text to two. Pretty simple. This doesn't really do anything. Display.set color white. We are using pretty cheap OLEDs. Basically, I bought you guys, I spent like a dollar more to get you guys um, the fancy OLEDs with like yellow and blue. So um, you'll guys have like that color scheme. But you can't really change the color because we are not fancy like this. So display.set cursor 15.0. So whenever you display something onto the OLED, you're always going to have to go ahead and see where it starts from. Basically, the cursor, like a cursor on a computer, has to start from a specific area. In this case, we're going to set cursor to 15.0. I think I pulled it out. Hold on. And so you'll set your cursor to 15.0. And by the way, the axis is a little bit weird because it starts from the top left corner. So the positive x axis goes to the right, and the positive y axis goes down. So 15.0 will be like the first line. Right? And on the first line, what's going to do, it's going to do display.println controls. So it's going to go, OK, controls. And every time this Arduino loops, it's going to keep printing controls until you print something different. Right? In order to print something different, you can either use a variable, or you can go ahead and use a state machine, or something else that gives it a different command. All right. Now let me go ahead and see what's up with my audio here. OK, I'm still on Snowball. That's good. Um, this isn't this working. Hello, hello. Okay, I think I'm still connected to the mic. Good. <laughs> All right. Are there any questions so far as to what's going on? Now, fair warning, you are going to be playing with this in a little bit. So um, most of the setup is done for you already, uh, but you will have to like, fill in the little blanks. And basically, you can like do something like design your own UI. And that's really cool. OK, wireless communication. Now, we're going to throw a lot of concepts. We, we, I mean, I already threw a lot of concepts at you today, but we're going to go one step further and do something really cool, which is how you can control something without you know, using wires. Because kind of like this, like I wish I had a wireless mic, so I wouldn't have to trip over myself doing this. Um, we can do wireless communication very easily using the Arduino through the use of the NRF24 L0 and module. OK. This is the NRF24 L01. Actually, this is the NRF24 L01 plus PA slash LNA. Um, this is a wireless transceiver, which is just transmitter and receiver mashed together. Right? So uh, what this does is it allows for, um, no, it allows for uh, you to transfer data across a wireless channel. And in this case, um, for the transceiver, it transmits communication using radio frequency signals. So basically, it selects a frequency, and then it sends a message across that. And then on the other end, if you have a, uh, another trans transmitter, um, or it would be a receiver, but it's the same module, you can accept that message and then process it and do things with it. So like with the RC car, with my controller, it has one of these modules on it. It's going to send a packet of information from this controller over the air into my RC car. Right? And then my RC car is going to go ahead and respond to that by driving forward, backwards, whatnot. And the way, reason I'm introducing this is because it's really like, it's going to be really hard for us to like do RC cars if we didn't do wireless. Because like literally, we're all going to trip over each other using a wire. Um, so it transmits data through a certain defined frequency. And now here's the thing, right? If we think about this a little bit, and we have a controller, uh, let's say, because you're going to be racing, uh, and it's going to be competitive. So let's say you're racing against your friend, um, and you want to drive your own cars. But you have to know that this transmits signals across a certain frequency, right? So if it's the same frequency, what's going to happen is you might be able to control your friend's car, or your friend might be able to control your car, or both cars may be controlled at the same time. No, that's called swarm. But you know, it's kind of like iffy as to how things are controlled using the frequency if they're on the same frequency channel. So what happens usually, and this happens in like big competitions too, is they give you a select frequency range in order to transmit that signal from. And usually that goes, it, it's passed into like a parameter. Uh, I don't have it here right now. Let's see what's on this slide. OK, I don't have it here right now. But what's going to happen is when you guys go to the lab and you find out your team, you're going to go ahead and um, see that your team is a three-digit number. And that three-digit number is going to represent the frequency channel in which your messages are sent. So every team will have their own like, way of communicating with their own RC car, and they won't get confused. Right? And I'm going to prevent you guys from changing channels, because I don't want you guys to sabotage other teams. And that's usually a rule. 
Um, I don't know if you guys know soccer stuff, soccer bot, but robotic soccer bot competition is like awesome. Like we competed in the last time for Hyperloop, um, but pretty much they had to like make a rule because I was like, what if I just made some sort of system that cycles through all the frequencies and then just sends like a stop command to each one of them. And basically, so like, I can like just make them stop. And they're like, no, I'm gonna put a stop to that. I'm gonna put in the official rule books. So, dang it. <laughs> but it's very cheesy because that's you know, scientifically how it works. So in this case, um, your team number will determine what frequency channel you're controlling your RC car across. And in the code, you'll literally see some line that says, insert your team number here. And that's what it's gonna be. So NRF24L01, what it does is it transmits 32 channels of data, each with one byte of information, right? So think of it like a traveling hotel with 32 rooms, and each room can carry eight people, right? Um, so in this case, that's what it is, basically. So every time you send a packet of information from the transmitter to the receiver, it's 32 bytes of data going through the air. Now, 32 bytes is actually not a lot of data, right? So it's really used for like small scale signals and small scale numbers. So, you know, communication pairs. There are a lot of communication pairs out there. The one we're using today is the RC car, which is the receiver and the controller, which is the transmitter. But you can have like all of the other things as well. Like for one of my projects, I have the controller as a transmitter and then I have a drone as a receiver, but it's still using the wireless communication, right? So in that case, if you wanna, you know, control a drone, control a like, submarine or control something else, you don't want to have to like follow it with the wire. Use one of these modules. Now, there are faster modules out there. I'll tell you this. One of the issues with this module is that you know it has some sort of delay in between the transmitting and receiving end. You can go ahead and try to increase the resolution to like decrease the delay, but usually what happens is that um, you're just gonna have to like stick with it a little bit. It's not noticeable after a while, but you know when you're first trying to drive the car, you'll be like, why is there so much delay between my control and the vehicle? The source code I'm giving you has that delay. You are able to minimize it a little bit, but it's more complicated. You gotta use timers for that. So here's a warning. Whenever you're working with these things, now, you know, it's electronics. Again, like the Arduino, it has a chance of blowing up. So in this case, um, this uses 3.3 volt logic at its VCC pin, which means this VCC is not five volts. Compared to like other things you do, like ultrasonic sensor, five volts. IR sensor, five volts. This thing, 3.3 volts. So don't try to put five volts in or else it won't work. It, you know, I, I've done that before. And there is a 50-50% chance that after you realize your mistake and you plug out the five volts, it'll break. But the other 50% chance is it'll work. Um, I've never seen, oh, magic smoke comes from this too. Like if you have a short in your circuit or something like that, um, you know, this thing will go kabloom. So do not connect five volts to this thing. Usually when you buy these on Amazon, what you'll see is they come connected to this like little regulator module on the bottom that turns the Arduino's five volts into 3.3 volts before sending it into this thing, right? But if you're building a PCB or doing something with just the top part of it, you wanna make sure that it gets 3.3 volts logic. So a lot of PCBs I make that use this kind of like technology has the regulator. I use the AMS117 3.3 volt regulator in order to um, get the voltage down to the right level in order to get into this thing. Here's a caution and something that actually improves the behavior of one of these modules. If you want your connection to be smoother and you want the data to be more accurate and you want it to be faster, solder a 0.1 microfarad capacitor. Now, this value is questionable because I've seen online, if you Google like what capacitor value should I solder onto my NRF24L01, there's like eight different answers. Um, generally, just any capacitor will do. I just choose 0 0.1 because I have like tons of these. Um, between the VCC and ground pins, and this will be used as to eliminate noise. So basically noise is when you have voltage, voltage coming into the, uh, the transceiver here, and the voltage goes like this. You want it to be straight and uniform, but it has a seizure, right? So it's really weird. And you don't want noisy voltage because then it's going to get confused as to what's getting powered from. Noisy voltage just means that it oscillates from like three volts to like five volts and then has a voltage spike somewhere random, some, something weird like that. To eliminate it, it's really easy. Just put a capacitor. Very simple. And the boards already have that for you. Okay, moving on to section six. Any questions on wireless transceivers so far? No, just skimming through it, but like, yes. 
so far what I've talked about? Yes. Yes. Anything else? Potentiometers, joysticks, um, the motors, motor driver, L298, they use five volts. So the NRF24 L01 is like the annoying little brother that needs like less chores to do. I don't know. <laughs> if, if voltage equals chores. <laughs> okay, let's go over types of Arduino. Now, um, at the beginning, I introduced the Arduino Uno, Mega, and Nano. But now we're going to talk about the Arduino Leo, the Yun, and the Micro. These are the special boards uh, that are depending on the 18 Mega 32U4 chip. Um, and again, they look like this. They kind of look like Arduinos, but the chip is different, right? Its brain is different. And the brain has been changed to allow for communication with like keyboards and stuff. Or sorry, you can use it in keyboards, but it communicates with the computer through USB 2.0 protocol. So it has built in USB 2.0 comms. And here are the specs as to the comparison between Arduino Leo and Arduino Uno. Different chip, digital IO pins. Leo has 20, Arduino Uno has 14. Leo wins. Analog input pin, 12 versus 6. The Leo wins. PWM channel, 7 versus 6. Leo wins. Leo also has different resolution PWM channels, by the way. So like, it has one that's like 8-bit, and then has one that's 10-bit, and then one that's 12-bit. It's really weird. But if you want like different sensitivities for PWM, you can like just arrange that internally. Um, so again, flash memory like RAM, 32 kilobytes, which four kilobytes are used by the bootloader. Like this Arduino loses because you know, use more RAM, but it's for a good cause. <laughs> so we are using the Arduino Pro Micro, which is not the Leo, but you know, Leo's great and all. It's also more expensive. <laughs> Um, and I think that's all I want to talk about this. Basically, a lot of keyboard enthusiasts use these boards in order to control computers with. Basically, you can build a keyboard off this microcontroller if you're into that kind of thing. ESP32, ESP8266. Right, give me one second. I've been talking for like an hour and a half straight, and my throat is closing up. Come on, this has a stand. So once you're comfortable of using the Arduino, you can use the ESP32 or the ESP8266 in order to um, go even further, right? At the beginning, I talked about my Alexa sync. Basically, what happened was my, my sync broke um, because of some plumbing issue. And as the amazing engineer I am, instead of fixing the sync, I built this whole contraption that allows, that has a pump connected to like a water reservoir that is connected to an ESP32 that is connected to my Alexa. So now whenever I say, Alexa, turn on my sink, my sink turns on. My sink is still broken, by the way. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> I'm not a plumber. I just like ESP32. These are Arduinos. They have the same GPIO functionality. They have the same ADC functionality. Only here, um, it's connected to the Wi-Fi, right? And you can connect it to your Wi-Fi at home. And a lot of people make smart homes of this. And you know, smart homes with the ESP32 is actually much safer than you know using Alexa or Google Assistant or whatever, right? Because like, who's going to collect your data? You. So um, this supports both the Arduino IDE and MicroPython software. Um, it contains both GPIO pins and ADC. Same thing, same thing. Um, SPI and I2C on the ESP32 are custom set, and they are actually multiplexed from the ES2's multiplexer. So you can't use them at this at the same time. Well, we really can. But you'll have to multiplex them. They're not distinctive pins. Um, and they're developing this board. And surprisingly, when we're talking about cost, it's really low in price. Um, ESP32s are like five bucks. They used to be like a buck. But that was like five years ago. Um, they're much cheaper than the Arduino because they have lower GPIO functionality, but they're still really good for like just basic operations. Um, connect to Alexa and other BLE devices, send and Dagi packets to local service, access websites and update data external. Yeah. You can access the internet. <laughs> so you can make an entire smart home like system out of this as a side project, which I know a lot of friends of mine already have done because it's just cool. Like you go into your house, you clap your hands, a noise detector says, uh, oh, you're home, turns on the lights, right? It's like James Bond in your house. If you guys wanna do that, you can. You're just gonna need like a relay because you're working with high power. Oh, good, I like the slide. Section 6.5, the part where I rant about how expensive Arduinos are these days. I don't know if anyone tries to buy Arduinos these days, but you know, like they used to be two, three bucks, and now they're like 20 bucks. 
for this thing. Not for this thing. You know, remember the first picture I showed in the PowerPoint about that Arduino in the bottom left corner? That thing's 20 bucks. It's like 25, 26 now. The official Arduino is $34. Before coronavirus, before 2019, it was approximately, you can buy it on Amazon for like five bucks. Five to 10 bucks, actually. It was that cheap because no one was using it. And then coronavirus came, everyone started doing home projects. Like if, you're, if you think that's expensive, like don't even talk about Raspberry Pis. Can't find them anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what they're supposed to sell it for? 75. Pi 4, 8 gigabytes, $75. During the pandemic, the Zero 02 came out. The, um, there's another one that also came out. But like basically, the, there's two Raspberry Pi versions I really wanted to get my hands on that had like an upgraded chip. I couldn't get them. I literally like was on the store like the day it released. Two seconds after, all gone. Yeah, I was kind of lucky. And I began electronics right before the prices skyrocketed. I currently have some pies in my possession. Thank goodness. And I use them for a lot of different applications. Like my 3D printers, one of them is connected to my Raspberry Pi, just for like autonomous control. Okay. But like, seriously, like Arduinos these days, you go on Amazon, eight, nine dollars for like a single board like this. Now these are the good ones. Um, La Fin board, 18 mega, 320p. I distinctly remember this is the knockoff board that I bought. By the way, these boards I'm going to be talking about aren't the real Arduino. They are not created by Arduino. Arduino has open source schematics, unlike Apple, <clears throat> that allows um, other people to make clones of. So you could go ahead and order a PCB off from some Chinese company and literally build an Arduino yourself. That's going to be really expensive though. It's like I calculated it, it's like $14, $15 just for all the parts. So you're more or less you know, better buying this, this thing. Um, this exact board, let me tell you a story. Um, during the summer of 2021, I did a project for my friends and it was uh, something along the lines of Nerf guns. Basically, I built like an automatic Nerf gun kind of thing using a solenoid and high power, basically working with a lot of these boards. I cannot tell you how many times I fried it because I screwed up my circuit and I had like a NMOS that basically voltage spiked and then destroyed this board. So it was okay. Summer 2021, guess how much this was? It was three for $10. It was like $3 per board. So like, I was like, okay, I'm not going to be scared if I like burn it because I can literally just buy one off Amazon. Like, cool. Cut to like three months later, shopped like $30 for three. I was like, it's $10 already. And this was a good one too. Like this was the knockoffs that work. Like a lot of Amazon boards you got to be careful of because they just don't work or they don't have the firmware. Um, firmware was the biggest issue because a lot of people don't know how to fix it. So, so they go, go ahead and sell like really cheap boards that don't have the bootloader on it. And then you have to do it yourself using like another Arduino. And then beginners are just complain and be like, I don't know how to do this. And I'm like, I get it, it's hard. But like buy knockoffs that already have the bootloader and already that work, and this is one of them. But they're freaking expensive. Um, I'll tell you the Arduino, Arduinos I bought for this workshop, um, they were about $5. But I went through like tooth, I, I, I fought tooth and nail for those Arduinos because like literally, Everyone else was selling them for like eight, seven, eight dollars. Um, so buying knockoffs, do you do it? I would say yes. Buy knockoffs. Just be sure to like ask a friend before you buy one. I don't know if you guys consider me as a friend, but like I suggest this one. Um, the, I can also suggest to you guys the ones used in the uh, workshop today, the Kukai Arduino Pro Micros. Those work amazing. Those are brilliant. So if you want a Nano, get this one. If you want a Pro Micro, get the one used in the workshop. This one is good though, because nanos have a lot of pins um, compared to other Arduino Pro Micro. Like I'll tell you the controller literally uses all the pins on the Arduino Pro Micro. Same for the RC car, like there's zero pins left. And then, so if you wanna talk about getting more GPIO pins, just use a shift register, a multiplexer, or like, I don't know. But like there's ways on getting more functionality out of your Arduino, but just like the base logic or the base firmware, uh, that's gonna have some properties. So knockoffs. They're amazing, they're great, they're inexpensive. The biggest pro, they're relatively easy to acquire, also good. They are a simple replacement. I mean, again, if you fry one, it's just like half an hour of work, but I mean like work as in pay. But, so it's not as simple anymore to replace, but you know, it's still good. Cons, it may not always have the right bootloader. 
So if you buy from like a Chinese company, your computer is going to think your Arduino is a virus. And it's going to be a little sketchy. Um, it also can be soldered really badly. So I remember like before this board became my favorite, I had another board that I used to always buy. But the USB cables was really, really flimsy. I'm not going to like name the company. But, like literally, it was an SMD component on top of the board. SMD means surface, not device. So it was literally soldered on top of the board. So it had like zero support. And whenever you plugged in the USB cable, the thing would just pop off. And then the, when it popped up, it took off a layer of the PCB. So literally, you couldn't solder it back together. And so like I just returned those. And basically, what they did, the company actually improved after that, because I got another board from them. They used through hole instead of SMD. So basically, they had the USB port directly into the board instead of on top of it. So that created a lot stronger connection. So good on them. They still did sell this thing for like $12, though. So, All right. Oh, we're here, the lab. All right, so Mancha's here. Mancha's the project director of Hyperloop. She's going to go ahead and talk about uh, the lab. But before you talk about that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce some things first. I'm sure you guys are all itching to go to the lab and try this stuff out. Because like I've talked about like almost a lot of, well, I've talked about a lot of things here, and you're going to implement them. Almost everything I talked about today, you're going to go ahead and program it, except for the LED which is probably one of the easiest ones, to be honest. OK, here's the task, all right? For the next hour and 30 minutes, you're going to go ahead and write efficient and well-formed code for the RF moduli mini controller and the RC driver RC car. If you guys don't know what that is, uh, I don't know if you bought a demo. They're not. They're not? Oh, never mind. So basically, there's a controller, and then there's an RC car. And you guys are going to write code for it, right? And you're going to go ahead and go to this uh, CLT code here. You can click on it once I post it in the disk, uh, Hyperloop server. And let me show you, Wes, what this looks like. OK, so you're going to go to this GitHub repository. And there's going to be two files inside of this. You're going to go ahead and make a new Arduino file. Hopefully, you have that downloaded. And you're going to be in groups of five. So go ahead and distribute the workload evenly, because you only have 1.5 hours to work on this. Um, there's going to be two scripts here, one being the RC driver script and one being the RF moduli mini. The RF moduli mini is going to be your controller. So inside the script, you're going to have a lot of instructions. I try to give as much help as possible without actually giving you the answer. So you'll see here that a lot of stuff is already set up for you. I gave you the pinouts. I gave you the packet. Now, here is where things start to get a little bit tricky. I set everything up to you, but now we just have blanks, right? So you're going to have to complete the code. Um, does anyone remember what I said about the warning for um, decreasing the resolution from 10 bits to 8 bits for at least? Um, reading this sort of stuff? No? So basically, you can't just directly get the potentiometer or the joystick input directly into the NRF24L01, because the NRF24L01 has only 8 bits. The, PW, uh, the ADC reading is 10 bits, right? So the hint is you need to find some way to get from 10 bits back down to 8 bits. And that's for the analog inputs. Now, there's like difference. Uh, there's analog read, there's digital read, there's digital write, there's analog writes. Um, but in general, you have a bunch of code here, and then you can have someone design their own OLED display. I gave you a template. This is the one that's on the actual thing. Uh, but if you want to go ahead and make your own, uh, feel free to do so. This will be on your controller, so you can actually see what's going on as you like, control the thing. So this is the first part of it. The second part of it is going to be the RC driver. So the RC driver is the RC car. I don't know, what, I don't know if the um, cars are built yet. I don't know if you guys know this, but like there's a whole team of people up there making the RC cars right now, and I'm literally stalling for time. So uh, <laughs> this is the RC car part of it. And we are going to go ahead and try to get these uh, cars to you as soon as possible. But pretty much what's going to happen is it's this whole separate code. This is the receiver code. So basically, you're going to have some like two people work on the controller. They're going to go ahead and finish the code for it. And they're going to have three people work on the RC car. And they're going to try to like finish the code for that. Now, this is skeleton code again. Uh, but here's the thing. Pin definitions is completely empty. So you know, I don't, I'm not going to tell you what those are yet, because I want you to go ahead and practice reading the schematic to find out. So those are going to be empty for you to find out. And then you're going to have a bunch of functions here. Now, you're going to have to like write your whole setup code. Most of it's already done for you. Just fill in the blanks. Pretty self-explanatory. Um, and then down here, in the loop section, you're going to have to write this code. Um, basically, I give you some tips and hints in order to get this to work. All you got to do is fill in the blanks. So you're going to fill in the blanks here. Basically, this is what's coming in from the controller. So exactly what does your controller need to do in order to actually drive the thing? And then if the controller 
that condition is true, it's going to run this function called forward, right? And this forward function, if you scroll even be more below, you're going to see just blinks. Basically, I want you to use digital read um, to be able to control your card. So you're going to get forward, backward, rotate CW, and rotate CCW as your templates. But again, this is a race, right? You guys are racing for prizes and glory. And believe me, there are prizes and glory. So you want to make sure that your RC card is optimized. So if you have extra time, I'm going to tell you right now, this code kind of sucks. It gets the car moving, but it's not really great at driving. So what you can do is optimization. You can write functions of your own in order to make your race car drive even faster, even smoother. So you'll go ahead and read through this and get the code ready. Um, if I scroll up here, you'll see some optimization tasks I've written. These, these are just my ideas. Basically something like, um, what happens if the RC car loses communication with the controller? Implement a fail safe to prevent disaster, right? This is a really basic UGV task because you know, if your controller disconnects for whatever reason, you don't want this thing driving off in the distance never to be seen again, right? You can also implement a motor speed PWM control system. So in general, I mean, even for my soccer bot last semester, I didn't have PWM, right? My, I just ran the motors full speed and then drove it. But if you want to have smoother turns, and I believe um, I'm just going to be talking about lists later, but our track has a lot of turns. And if you're trying to use um, the system in which I gave you, that's going to be really, really hard. And like, you know, the race, you're trying to get to the end fast. So implement a better turning system, basically. Um, have the potentiometer inputs do something with the car. Uh, state machines, switch inputs, precise speed predefined actions. Uh, everything here is just to make your life easier when you're driving the car. All right. So you guys know what to do. Complete the code in 1.5 hours. Um, and then after the 1.5 hour time, I think I'm, I've been talking for so long, so I think we're going to give you like until 7.15, I think. Just a little more time. Uh, you guys are going to go ahead and race through the CPP Hyperloop uh, Season 3 Grand Prix race. So your car and controller will be put to the test on the actual racetrack, uh, which is on floor 3, Kashma. Okay, so I'll have Mancha explain what that is. It's either going to be blue painters tape or red and white barriers are about, you know, this time tall. It's for RC car tracks. Uh, collision is allowed. You can battle with other cars during the actual race, not during the qualifying rounds. So there's two rounds. Um, there are going to be 14 to 16 teams going in the first qualifying round. So let's say team 100 will set you off. 30 seconds later, team 101 will go off and 102. And there'll be a timer at the end. By the time all 16 teams or 14, uh, the top six teams are, are going to do an actual race where you can collide into each other. Um, and then try not to damage them too much. They're like $120 each. So mm -hmm. bump into them, you know, shove them aside. Don't do full crashes. There is a ramp. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to say anything more there. Don't, you know, like go up the ramp and then try to go on the side. Um, but that's that. The full track is done and ready. And you can look at it as you go up. Yes. Thank you, Mancha. This is the first time we're ever doing this. I think this is the first time the school is ever doing something like this. So we're excited to see how it goes. So pretty much uh, we're going to have at seven at, at 8.15, we're going to say, stop coding. Everyone come down to floor three. We're going to have the race, right? Um, is that it? OK. So before we I, I assign you to the teams, and we're going to do this in a very orderly fashion. Everyone here can start packing up, but don't leave the room yet, right? So while you're packing up, I'll explain what this is. So pretty much both, wait, I'm not sure. Does the PCB work? Oh, one works? My PCB works? Okay, okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. So everyone, um, basically what happens is, uh, oh, what, I'm going to tell, tell you guys what happened. So basically, um, this one is the controller board. It works really well because I've tested it a lot. Um, and you can go ahead and look at the pinouts here. So it's going to be on a PCB. You're not going to do the hardware. But you're just going to look at this and just like, you know, see what's up. This is the Arduino Pro Micro. You can go ahead and use these node labels to see exactly where each end goes. So instead of just connecting wires all over the place, I use this thing called net labels. So if I say D10 goes to, D10 goes to, Where's D10? Oh, haha, <laughs> D10 goes there, right? 
So this is going to be the joystick, right? And this is going to be the button for the joystick. So that's how you read the uh, schematic. The more important one is RC driver. So what Mancha said is the RC cars are still being made. This PCB literally came in like 30 minutes before the workshop started, like without being soldered or anything. Because I had a customs delay. I ordered these last week, and it just kept getting delayed and delayed. And I didn't think we were going to get this. So we had a backup plan in which we were going to use breadboards, but that's kind of boring. So I'm so glad it works. Your task is going to go ahead and read the schematic and try to assign the right pinouts to the right locations. Just trust us that we're going to connect it to the right place. So for example, if you're going to get a pinout like in 4R, that's going to represent the L298, the fourth pin, and the right L298 node. So this is going to go to this JST, which is going to go to pin 7 right here. So you'll see it's painfully obvious on the um, PCB where this is located. But in general, you'll see that this in 4R is connected to D9. So you're going to have to assign it correctly inside the code. Now, you're not going to be able to test this until like later because we're still making it. But hopefully, this schematic should give you enough information in order to complete the code. OK. I'm sure you guys are all itching to see what the prizes are. And um, this is what the controller looks like, by the way. The prizes. So third place. Now, when I see the prizes, like all five team members are going to get this, right? Third place is going to get a bronze winner's trophy. What is a trophy? I don't know yet. But it's going to be bronze, and it's going to be cool. So winners will get a bronze winner's trophy for third, being in third place. Second place, you're going to get a silver winner's trophy and a free Blinky Learner 1 soldering kit with the color of your choice. Ooh. Ah. So if you are coming in second place, that's what you're going to get. And then for the grand prize, first place, you're going to get a golden winner's trophies. You're going to, have, going to, have, you're going to get a free controller. Uh, which is like $40, $50. And then you're going to get free personalization on it. So if you want anything written on like your name, um, a specific color, whatever, it's yours. So this is for all five people who win. Now, the race is just to get to the finish line as fast as possible. Uh, and we will be you know, refereeing that along the track. If you, if you go out of bounds, like, I think they can just place it back. Yes? Five. Okay. They're teams of five. Okay. Yes. So what we're going to do is, um, so these are the prizes. We'll announce them at the very end. We'll do this whole like announcement ceremony, because it is the last workshop after all, so we're going to make it big. All right, teams. Now, there was an option on the sheet. If you wanted to be in a specific team uh, and color, I think Mancha tried to put you one. Um, so let's see what, we're do what we get. OK, so here's a map of the school. Literally, what's going to happen is you guys are going to go off uh, in groups of whoever's on this list. So in this case, if you are in Team 100 or Team 101, you guys will be assigned to Room 401. So you, now, right now, you can stand up and start walking up. And if you walk past floor three, you can take a look at what the track looks like. Like, even I don't know what the track looks like. So, <laughs> so Team 100, Transparent Blue, Kai, Justin, George, Bork, and Adeline, uh, you'll be in 401. And Team 101, uh, Karina, Michael, Richie, Kevin, and Tristan, you'll be in Room 401. You can go up now. So we're going to uh, go up in like slide by slide basis. Yeah. Oh, are they group five? Yes. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Managing cats. <laughs> yeah. I got it working. So, yeah. You need to group them here. Group them here? Group them here. So, team 100, if you're here, come here. Okay, okay, never mind. Come back. come back. Come back. All right, I'm going to stop the recording here, uh, but thank you guys so much for watching if you are, uh, and we're going to do the race now. So, see ya.